There are times in Formula 1 when teams start to find holes in rulebooks to exploit an advantage, and we've seen this multiple times through these videos. Blown diffusers that made their reappearance in 2011 after falling out of favour around the mid-90s, the double diffusers that preceded them that were banned after two seasons, then you had dual axis steering recently that Mercedes had, or that massive fan that Brabham fixed to the back of the car to provide downforce, but because it cooled the engine more than it sucked the car to the ground, it was totally legal. But there have also been occasions when the FIA has seen teams doing something, or at least suspected that teams were doing something, and just gone, you know what, just do it. In 2000, the BBC reported that Max Mosley, the then head of the FIA, had said that a team had cheated over the course of the 1999 season, using technology that had been banned and had somehow managed to get it onto their cars and get it through every piece of scrutineering throughout the season, and the FIA started hinting at who it might have been. Mosley said, I'm not going to name the team, but they were prepared to do something which was quite clearly outside the rules. We became aware of it over the winter, but we do not have 100% proof at the moment. When we do, we will have a word with them, but I do not believe it materially affected the course of the championship. That BBC article was posted back in the April of 2000, the 7th to be precise, which was the Friday before the San Marino Grand Prix. Although the article doesn't name or shame, in other articles Mosley said that the team in question was a midfield team which at the time got the Autosport Forum to wash with speculation because there was a debate over who was a midfield team, and which year was Max referring to? 99? Or 2000? Because if he was referring to 2000, the midfield teams would have been Jaguar, Sauber, Jordan, BAR and Benetton. If he was referring to 1999, it was going to be Stewart, Benetton, Prost, Williams and Sauber. If Sauber actually finished a race, because there is a sea of purple on the Wikipedia page for the 1999 season. Just Sauber. DNF across the board. It's quite bad really. I mean by 2023 standards at least. There was also debate on whether Jordan was midfield or not because there is that oft-cited opinion or fact, depending on who you talk to, that Frentzen was in contention for the 1999 championship, winning two races and could have had a third of the Nürburgring if the car had behaved itself. But when it comes down to it, Stewart and Jordan are the two teams that people reckon it is because both teams have made massive strides forward in the 1999 season. Stewart had scored 6 points in 1997, 5 in 1998 and then started scoring well during 1999. Most of that being due to reliability to be fair because like the Saubers in 1999, the Stewarts were retiring left, right and centre through 1997 and 1998. But in 1999, they'd won a race and been way more competitive with Barrichello scoring three podiums, Herbert winning the Nürburgring, and the team finishing fourth with 36 points. Although that was just one point ahead of Williams. Jordan meanwhile had finished fourth in 1998 and finished third in 1999, with Frentzen absolutely destroying a completely done Damon Hill who had reached the point of not caring anymore. As discussed during the 1999 British Grand Prix story a few weeks ago, he actually wanted to retire after that race but was convinced to stay. During the final race in Suzuka, he pulled into the pits with handling issues, but the truth was, as he admitted in his autobiography, which is a good read by the way, he just didn't care anymore. He just wanted it over and done with. Also in that book, Damon admitted the struggles he had with the car and how he was starting to become involved in more accidents. At Australia, Brazil, Monaco and Canada, he was involved in some sort of collision with Brazil being his fault hitting Verts at Turn 1, and at Canada when he was one of the founding members of the Wall of Champions Club with Schumacher and Villeneuve. But at the French Grand Prix in Manicourt, his electrics went. At Hockenheim, his brakes failed. Another electrical problem at the Nürburgring, and another collision at Malaysia. And then at Suzuka, he just went, sod this, I'm out. The electrical problems, it turns out, was something to do with how Jordan and Mugen Honda had got everything hooked up. Jordan was running some sort of legal traction control. How they were doing it, it's not been documented, but it might be that they were hiding it in the engine maps like Red Bull had done in 2012. What happened there was the FIA had to issue a clarification in Article 5.5.3 of the technical regulations, because what Red Bull and Renault had done is that they managed to reduce torque in the mid-RPM range and give Vettel and Weber a bit more control at the rear end on corner exit. The engine maps affected the ignition timing, fuel mixture, power and torque delivery, and because there was no outright software buried in the ECU, a la the infamous Option 13 code for Benetton's launch control, there was no way of detecting it when the cars were checked over. Very clever, but by the definition of the rulebook, illegal. But where Jordan fell foul here is that at some point Frentzen and Hill had to turn off the system to prevent the electronics overheating, 
Or something to that effect. Damon mentioned it in his book that if they didn't turn it off after a certain point, it fried the electronics. And that's what happened for the electrical issues suffered by Hill and Frentzen at different points of the season, especially during the round of the Nürburgring. I can't find the exact quote from watching the wheels. I've referenced it in a previous video, but my copy of the book is in a box in my new house and I'm at the flat I'm moving out of, so that book isn't behind me on my bookshelf. I haven't thought this through, have I? So we'll go with both bits, then I can confirm later on in the comments or someone can confirm it for me if they read the book on my behalf. They either had to turn it off at a certain point to save the electronics, or it was typical new untested technology that just burned itself out. It's probably the former I do remember Damon saying he had to turn it off at some point. So all this leads back to Mosley and the FIA. They had win that someone was cheating, in inverted commas, but they couldn't prove it. With the way Formula 1 was evolving at this time, it was going to come sooner or later that a team was going to try and bend the rules to gain some sort of competitive advantage by doing something clever with the software in their engine or the, you know, the actual engine maps and things like that. And that once one team had got wind that another team was doing it, they would try and copy it and the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mosley also said that there is beginning to be signs of a culture of cheating in Formula 1 and we are determined to stop it. Adrian Newey at the time was convinced that cars had won races with some sort of illegal traction control and said that something needed doing about it. He probably said, telling the McLaren mechanics to look salty and to stop laughing. So the FIA went away and started a working group to figure out what to do with what was happening. They were convinced the team or teams were cheating, they just needed a way of proving it. After a while, the FIA came to the conclusion that there was no way they could police it under the then regulations and decided that they were just going to simply allow traction control systems once again. These systems were legalised for the Spanish Grand Prix. Anticipating a mid-season permission of traction control, the teams had already been testing systems on their cars ahead of time to get the systems working based off how their engines and cars behaved so that they could get the most out of them and hit the ground running. As a result, the latter part of the V10 era had cars with distinctive noises as they hammered the throttle coming out of corners. The ability to use traction control was met with mixed responses from the drivers and fans. Jarno truly said it was a good idea because it now meant that everybody was at the same level, as did Ralph Schumacher, while the fans thought that it wasn't a good idea because they wanted the drivers to be more in control rather than having the cars help them along, although they weren't being helped in any way like they were in the early 90s because those cars had anti-lock brakes, automatic gearboxes, active suspension, but automatic gearboxes were later permitted, as was launch control. The difference was that for the most part, they weren't fully automatic. They were automatic on the upshift to get the most out of the torque and things like that. So it was just perfect bang on every single time, but with a manual downshift. Which is also what McLaren got in trouble over after the San Marino Grand Prix of 1994. They had an automatic gearbox system on the car, but because it wasn't technically fully automatic, they got away with it. Well, I mean, they were fined, but they didn't get you know, completely penalised. Traction control was then ultimately banned for the 2008 season, and all cars made to use the same engine control unit to prevent the teams from hiding software and code within the engines. It's still banned, even today, although as mentioned in 2012, Red Bull tried something similar to Jordan, but were told to knock it off and put their engine maps back to how Renault initially built the engines. But the traction control era was certainly interesting. What did you think about it at the time if you watched Formula 1 at that time? How do you look back on it now? Was it a good thing or a bad thing? Let me know in the comments. So then a look at how Jordan might have actually got the rules changed so that traction control was allowed again in Formula 1. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And if you want to see more stuff like this, then get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on any future videos. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk of Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help out with supporting the channel at a more personal level, then a link to Patreon is in the description along with the link to Discord and my socials, as well as an F1 store affiliate link where if you buy anything, I get a kickback. Or the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off tip. So until next time, I've been Aina Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.